How's everyone doing? Doing well, thank you. Thanks for hosting another one of these. Thanks for joining. Thanks for hosting, Chris. Good to see you, Kelly. You too. Give just a couple more minutes before we get started. Can I sit next to Tara? I just learned today that they're not in the same place for everyone. <laughs> I was trying to high five someone on my screen and they were not high fiving me back. Kelly, the only rule is we have to sit in the back row, okay? You know I'm a front row girl, Tara. <laughs> I'll sit in the back with you. I can I can do that. All right, back on you. I like to just give a couple minutes for any technical difficulties as we've all had a few in our new Zoom world.
Right on. 17 peeps. Well, hey, um, for anyone that, that I haven't met before, my name is Chris Rogers. I'm an examiner in the Rocky Mountain region. I'm also the committee chair for the snowboard discipline here in Rocky Mountain, and I'm a uh, national team member for PSIA ASI. Um, for the last five years, or preceding this year, the previous five years, I was the manager of training at Vail Mountain. And um, this, this presentation is something that came out of, of my time as a training manager. Uh, it's something I've done a number of times in person. It also turned into an article for both the NSAA journal um, and uh, 32 degrees. And the concept is, is defensive skiing and snowboarding, sim similar to um, defensive driving. And, and I'll get into a bunch of those, those details about, about what that is. A um, couple of, of other just kind of ground rules before I get going. Uh, I, I, I self-moderate. I don't use a different moderator. I, I stop and ask questions as we go. I have a few points uh, in the PowerPoint where I'll, I'll throw questions out. And uh, I'm, I'm learning to get more comfortable with, with silence on Zoom. It's, it's one thing to be comfortable with silence in a, in a group in a room where if you're quiet for 10 seconds, people start to feel the need to speak. And I'm finding on Zoom, it, it tends to take a little bit longer and you know, unmuting yourself or posting a question, typing out a question to post. Um, so there'll be times where I just won't say anything for 60 seconds and, and give you guys time to, to type in the chat or, or speak up. Um, for that, the way I tend to go with, if you have a question, either post it in the chat or just say you have a question in the chat and I'll kind of roll through and call on people in that order. Uh, just easier because a lot of times when I have the, the PowerPoint up, I can't see people's hands raising all the time. So um, throw a question in there if, if you have one uh, or just wait for, uh, for times where I stop and ask if you have questions and, and, uh, and jump in then. Um, otherwise, I jump back and forth a little bit between the, the presentation and, and the full screen view. And, and that's just trying to create some social engagement, but also work through a PowerPoint and, and show some, some materials that are stored there. Um, I think that's pretty much it in terms of, uh, of setup. And uh, going back to being a training manager, obviously I worked for Vail Resorts, which has a very high safety focus as, as any of you that have worked for a company like Vail before. Uh, they have millions of dollars in work comp injuries and, and that focus came from there. But it also came from, this project came from a couple of my own experiences with, with near misses, as well as um, while I was in the middle of, of researching a lot of this, I got a speeding ticket in Wyoming. I was actually uh, up in uh, uh, near Jackson Hole paddleboarding and kayaking with Eric Rolls and driving back, I think I was going like 95 and an 80, something like that on, on I-80. And, and uh, the officer ended up giving me a ticket for nine miles an hour over, so staying under that 10 mile an hour zone, so I didn't have to come back for a court appointment, which I was very appreciative of. Um, but one of the things that they do in Wyoming is they give you the choice to take a online defensive driving course instead of like, and it waives your points or any, any fine. And, and I was like, yeah, that's great. I'm in the middle of this kind of defensive snowboarding uh, and skiing concept right now. Anyways, I'll take this, cl this class. And, and so I actually then started researching a bunch on defensive driving techniques and how to apply that to skiing and snowboarding. So that's where a lot of this content comes from. And uh, uh, this is the first time presenting this in a digital format. So uh, bear with me as, as some of it, uh, I do a lot of like stand up games and moving around and, and uh, stuff like that in the in-person version. So we, we won't get that side of it, but we'll kind of talk through some of that. So here we go. Dreadnought ran into a mother and her five-year-old daughter who were stopped on the slope. The snowboarder and young girl died in the accident.
right. So first piece there is, uh, is just, have you been in a collision? And, uh, you know, you don't, you don't have to, you don't have to stand up, identify yourself or say if it was life threatening or not, but you know, the, a collision bad enough to knock the breath out of you. Obviously most of us have been some kind of, of uh, collision with a, with a student at half of half a, you know, meter away and, and a, a small, small student runs into you or whatever, but talking more about like actual collision, something bad enough to knock the breath out of you. And, and if you have, you know how, how scary they are. And, and, and I never have been in one, but uh, in talking to people and doing interviews and building this content, uh, talking to a lot of people that have been in bad collisions, it's, it's scary and it can be pretty life threatening. From there, a little bit less. Have you had a close call? And I, I imagine if we, if we were in a room and, and asked people to stand up or raise their hands, 99.9% .9 of the room is going to stand up for have you had a close call, right? We have had close calls. Being stationary objects on the mountain as instructors often, uh, having people coming by us, there are a number of close calls. And I know this is where I certainly have had a lot of more experience where I haven't been in a true collision. Um, I've had some close calls, both, both ones that were probably um, more my fault and definitely several that were other, other people, you know, not paying attention coming, coming close to me. And as I started talking to people, as I was building out this concept of defensive skiing and snowboarding, I was asking these two questions. Have you been in a collision? Have you had a close call? And then finally, what was the, what separated those close calls from the collisions? And I gathered a ton of data on this, on what, you know, what was it that made it a close call, not a collision? Did you look up and see that person coming and get out of the way? Were you um, aware and alert already? You know, what were the things that happened that prevented close calls from being collisions? And if you just take a, a couple of seconds here and think back to if you have a close call that, that stands out, what was it that prevented it from being a collision? And one of the ones that stands out in my mind, I was doing a level three exam, um, actually at Vail Mountain, and myself and the other examiner, this was a, a paired exam format, had stationed ourselves um, kind of at the bottom of this pitch, we were doing large radius carve turns and the run it was a real nice, it's a, it's a long, wide, clean run. And then, then the very end, it makes this big turn to the left. And we put ourselves right at the bottom in that corner on the outside of the corner so we could see the whole run. And um, you really none of the, you know, watching the participants, it was like the fifth or sixth person performing these large radius carves. Uh, one of them lost their toe side edge, just like blew out of a toe side edge. They're I don't know, maybe 50 yards away from us. And, and it was hard packed and they just beeline straight towards us. And uh, Chuck, the other examiner, dove to his right and I dove to his left and the candidate went right through where we were standing and, and, uh, and slid kind of into the soft snow on the side of the run. No injuries, no collisions. Obviously we were alert, paying attention and watching it, but he and I were both positioned such that we could move quickly. And, and that was really what separated that from being a collision. If, if we hadn't been prepared to move, it wouldn't have mattered that we were watching. If we'd been stuck, we wouldn't have been able to get out of the way. And, and so that's one that stands out in my mind. And if you, if you just take a couple of, of seconds here and reflect back on something that was a close call that stands out in your mind, and then throw in the chat as we're moving forward, um, what was it that separated that? And, you know, it can be just a couple of quick words that separated it. Like um, I, I caught something out of the corner of my eye. Um, I moved quickly, I reacted. Um, you know, they turned to the last second. Like, what was it that separated that close call from being a collision? Doesn't have to be from during a lesson, no. Any any time, any time it was uh, something that could have been a collision and was avoided. Jen says, avoided by my awareness of my surroundings. Yep, one of the really common ones that came out. Lynn with the big words. I don't actually know how to say that one. Ex exteroception and paying attention. Peripheral vision. I don't know if you guys have Googled collisions on YouTube. It's not fun. Like that video is, is kind of some minor ones. Like they, they're, they'll make your like gut clench a little bit, but they're not some of the bad ones. Chuck Jung, luck. Um, Chuck, do you want to elaborate that on why, why it was luck? 
Well, I just felt like it. I just got lucky that uh, I was at the right place at the right time where I could do where I needed to be. I wasn't in between a turn or I wasn't where I could make, I wasn't depressured or anything like that. I was just right at a turn where I could make a little jog and then they, and then miss the, you know, the lucky participant. Cool. So, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to challenge you a little bit on the luck thing uh, as we go a little bit further, because um, one of the, one of the kind of, uh, tenets that I, I work off here is that uh, as developed athletes, we have quicker reaction times. And so it may, have, it, it may be a, a part, partial luck for sure, but I would, I would bet that some of it is your athleticism, your experience, um, and your being in a place that, was, that made you ready to make a change. That's not 100% luck. That's some, that's some amount of trained experience as well. Yeah, that it may be, but also I also had another collision this year with an instructor where she caught me from behind. I didn't see her at all. And, and I was more lucky that I didn't get hurt, but unfortunately yeah. she did. So. And that's, and, and it's, that's a good point. And I'm actually glad you raised that. It was something I, I intended to say, obviously, as we talk about this, there are, there are very real life, life uh, changing consequences of collisions. And we all know people that have had those. And, and as we work through this, I, I, I never mean to, to make light of that or, or uh, take away from, those injuries that are absolutely, you know, change people's lives. What we do get into is some of those tactics that we can train and try to prevent those in, in future circumstances. A few other ones in here that have shown up. Um, Stephanie said, or Jay said, the other skier and I turned quickly toward, turned quickly away from each other. Stephanie glancing uphill while moving and turning, seeing something out of the corner of your eye, going back to that concept of per peripheral vision. Uh, Ryan says he was positioned facing up the hill talking to a student and had time to see it coming his way. So positioning and vision there. Uh, Dr. Bart said looking as he merged on the slope. Alex said the sound of the skier coming up from behind. Again, so awareness of surroundings, that kind of, uh, I've referred to this as perceptual vision. It's not just what we see with our eyes, but what we are, all of our perception, our, our kinesthetic and our, our auditory cues as well. Kelly says a former student of mine sent it over head wall nice and big and I was just at the bottom of the blind spot ahead of him. Just complete luck that I was out of the way before his snowboard chopped my head off. Timing, right? That, that one comes down to that timing and that can often feel like luck. Tara says listening as well. Cool. So this is what I did on a much bigger scale. And this is back in 2014, 2015, asking people what were those, what were those changes? What made it a near miss instead of a miss? And that, that's what informed a lot of this content on spatial awareness. Now there's two kinds of zones of spatial awareness. Uh, there's, there's spatial awareness and situational awareness. And, and some people really get um, into the definitions. I use them kind of interchangeably. Spatial awareness often re re relates more to our awareness of what's going on. And then situational awareness is how we react to those surroundings and those changing situations around us. Um, I use them kind of interchangeably, but if you get into like the, the real um, definitions of them. There are some slight, slight differences. Uh, the military uses the term situa situational awareness a lot more. So the general definition of spatial awareness is knowing where your body is in space in relation to objects or other people. To have good spatial awareness, you also need to understand and respond to, the, um, to a change in position from those objects. So we also have an assumption we make about, uh, not an assumption, but a statement we make about spatial awareness and that this is that it's trainable, that our most highly skilled athletes are better at using visual information than the average person and are therefore able to react more quickly. There's a reason that someone who's good at tennis can make that move that maybe we can't. There's a reason that a top skier can make uh, something like a stivet and, and make that quick change in, in correction and get back into a new carve, right? There, these are trainable, spatial awareness is trainable. And um, my, actually my trainer presentation when I, when I uh, went through my Rocky Mountain Trainer uh, pathway back in 2009 was built on an article about Wayne Gretzky, about, about spatial awareness and about field sense. And this, this idea that um, our most skilled athletes have this kind of sense that's been said they were born with, the ability to know where the hockey puck is on the ice all the time, uh, that ability to pass without looking, uh, the ability for someone to land a triple cork and know where their where their feet are in relation to the snow or where their head is in relation to the snow and and often we have said these are things you're born with or or you're not 
but there's an entire field built up around the idea of training spatial awareness. This is, this is something you know that our top ski and snowboard athletes are doing in, in places like Woodward at Copper, training that um, that sensory motor feeling of being upside down, training their their perceptual vision, their awareness of uh, where they are in the air, where they are in space, and that and that with constant practice, athletes can learn to react to a signal as soon as as it per, appears in their peripheral vision. This is a lot of um, you know, football, soccer, tennis, a lot of traditional sports playing with that, where is the edge of your, um, of your peripheral vision and learning to react to that signal more quickly. Today, we're gonna play a game specifically designed to test your spatial awareness. Meet the Brain Games Double Dutch Team. What does jumping rope have to do with the brain? Well, double dutch requires off the chart spatial awareness. And today these kids are gonna help us test yours. For this game, all you have to do is keep track of the number of times that either of the girls in green jumps. You'll count each time one of them lands a jump, like this. One, two, three, four, five. As you can see, these jumpers are pretty quick on their feet. So you're gonna have to pay attention to keep up. When the whistle blows, start counting. Ready? Go. So, how many jumps did the green team make? Did you say 38? If so, you agreed with 40% of our test audience. <laughs> now, some of you may be on to us, but for those of you who aren't, did you happen to notice anything else going on during the double dutch? Maybe a giant chicken strolling right through the middle of the set and doing a funky chicken dance? Now, some of you may have missed that funky chicken, but many of you probably saw it, and that's okay because the chicken was just there to distract you too. Here's the real question. What color was the wall behind the double dutch game? All right, what color was the wall? Lynn says purple. Kept changing. Gray. Here we go. Whoa. Was when they started jumping. Dutch game. Here's a hint. It wasn't the same color at the end as it was when they started jumping. The back wall was changing color the entire time, from bright blue to bright red. Nearly everyone misses it, but why? It turns out there's far too much information coming in through the eyes at any given moment for the brain to fully process all of it. As a result, the brain has to act like a spotlight, focusing our attention on some parts of the scene, but not others. Now, most of you were probably paying attention to the jumpers, and some of you may have suspected that something strange was going to happen, and so you saw the chicken. <laughs> but you probably weren't paying attention to the back wall. And what we don't pay attention to we don't see. And uh, hey, for those of you who managed to catch everything so far, did you notice that we also swapped the rope turners out halfway through? Gotcha. Cool. So a really, a couple of really key pieces in there. Uh, the concept of there's too much happening and so our visual cortex filters it out, right? And this concept of an attentional spotlight uh, is brought up there. And we're gonna go a little bit more into depth with that in the next video. Um, I do like to call out these brain games videos. I use them all the time in presentations. They're on Netflix. And and if you're looking for something to watch during quarantine, there's hundreds of episodes of brain games that you can watch. Uh, and then you can get them on YouTube and pull them into presentations. But I, I tend to use them because they highlight examples like this really well of where 
Um, you know, you might, maybe you saw the chicken. In, in audiences where I've, I've played this, um, sometimes up to 50% of people will raise their hand and say they saw the chicken. And um, probably less than 20% noticed the, the changing colors in the background. I've never had somebody in a in-person presentation who saw the rope turners change out. And, and so this idea of filters, there's another video that Brain Games does uh, that asks you to watch a kickoff and, and you're supposed to be watching whether or not uh, it's a side view and you can see the, the stands or the, the uprights and the kickers kicking the football through the uprights. And it's kind of a weird angle. It's, it's hard to see whether or not the football is going through. Um, but in the front, there's cheerleaders and three of them take off an upper overlayer they're wearing an underlayer shirt, but they take off their, their upper layer and no one sees that one. And, and same idea that our brain is filtering out based on what we're paying attention to. And the more someone says, pay attention to this, the less likely we are to see the things around us. And that's one of the concepts that leads into a huge majority of car accidents and collisions on snow is we're paying attention to one thing and something blindsides us from another direction. You're watching the stoplight, you get T-boned, right? There's, there's this, the sense that some visual information that came out from somewhere other than where we're paying attention is often um, often where that that collision can come from. Donnie says that's how magic works. That's a it's very uh, true, as we're about to see. Oops, wrong share. What I think is interesting about the term misdirection is it's a misnomer. Most people think it means look at this hand while I do something with this one. But actually, what I want to do is direct and control your attention, at least know where it is. Because if I send your attention off into the darkness, it can come around just like throwing a boomerang and hit me when I don't want it to. So I like to think of it as attention. Because control is a hard word, but I manage the attention kind of like water flow. When I see where it goes, and then I have to move with that. Your attentional spotlight is only the size of your thumbnail, one one thousandth of your field of view. That means if I can see where your eye motion is, I can now navigate around that and do certain things. Plus, because you have to make choices between all your senses, your vision, your hearing, all those are coming into one spot. If I can tap into your priority system, I can now start hacking to reprioritize certain things so that other things will go under the radar. And that's a very interesting way to take advantage of attention. Try to follow along. If I put the cap on the pen, it looks like it goes away. Yet right now, it's behind my elbow. If I put it back on the pen, it goes away, but now it's behind my ear. Now, if you did this slowly, you could see when I put the cap on the pen. Yet it seems like the cap went away, and now the cap is behind my ear. It's a fun game, isn't it? So out of the previous video, we talked about how much information there is entering the visual cortex uh, at any given time. And, and Apollo there in that one's Apollo Robbins takes it a little bit further and, and tells us that our att attentional spotlight is about the size of our thumbnail. So if you hold your hand out in front of you, you know, you do this one, like you're eyeing something out, um, to something about 20 feet in the distance, you know, if you've got a wall across the room and you hold your thumb up to that wall, your attentional spotlight's about the size of your thumbnail. So if you move your thumb around and keep your eyes focused on that, on your thumb as you move through here, there's a lot more in the world around that attentional spotlight, but that attentional spotlight, that, that piece the size of your thumbnail is really what your brain is actually focused on at any given time. And a couple of fun things you can do with that if you're ever uh, out, out in public and you've got um, a, a billboard or a, a bunch of writing somewhere, if you put your thumb up and look at your thumbnail and try to read the outside of the sign, what you'll find is your eye immediately moves and, and there's um, these, your eye moves incredibly fast. So when we think the world is in focus, it's really not. It's just that size of the th thumbnail that's actually in focus. If you think about what's in focus, our eye moves so quickly that when you're reading or when you, especially when you're looking at something a long ways away, 
it's moving to fill in that information. Our peripheral vision is incredibly unclear. And even if you're looking at words through your peripheral vision, you think you can read those letters because your eye moves so quick to be able to read them. And if you stay focused on a thumbnail, it's really impressive how little you can read outside of that, that zone. Um, something kind of, kind of fun to, to play with. So those two concepts play in to a huge piece of the rest of this on defensive skiing and snowboarding. So what is defensive skiing and snowboarding? We, I've got a couple, a couple of terms defined here. And, and again, this comes out of, again, borrowing this language uh, from, from defensive driving is skiing and snowboarding in a manner designed to reduce the risk of collisions and injuries by anticipating dangerous situations despite adverse conditions or the mistakes of others. It's being aware and ready for whatever happens. You're not skiing or snowboarding timidly. You're ready to take action and not put your fate in the hands of others. And the key is the difference between this and the responsibility code. The responsibility code or, or park smart are the things that everyone should do. And in a perfect world, those things would prevent a vast majority of collisions. If everyone skied in control and rode in control, if everyone treated the people ahead of them like they had the right of way, right? Think about the number of times, like we know that one, we're all experienced skiers and snowboarders. We know the people ahead of us have the right of way, but how annoyed do we get when we're cut, cutting through a cat track and the person in front of us is making those big wide turns and we just wanna get across and pass them. We, we very easily ski or ride like people ahead of us don't have a right of way. Stop in a safe place for you and others when starting downhill or merging, look uphill and yield. Um, observe signs and warnings and know how to use the lift safely, right? These things would prevent the majority of injuries if everyone practiced them 100% of the time, use them 100% of the time, you know, the, the big ones being able to stay in control. It means being able to stop at all times. So the responsibility code is the things everyone should do. The difference as we get into defensive skiing and snowboarding is their learnable and trainable skills and behaviors that helps you keep yourself safe uh, helps you anticipate dangerous situations and reduce collisions and injuries despite adverse conditions or others' mistakes. And that's, that's the key piece that the responsibility code leads out is what do you do when someone else doesn't do that, right? What do you do when somebody else doesn't yield at a merge? What do you do when somebody is sitting below a roller? What do you do when the person behind you is going to run into you because they aren't treating you like you have right away? Um, and, and so these become really, really specifically tactics and, and trainable skills and behaviors you can use to protect yourself versus responsibility code being the rules of the road. And the same thing goes to, right, the, the speed limit on the highway, that's the rule, how we actually drive defensively, checking our blind spots, checking our corners, checking our mirrors, all of those kind of things, the things that we can do to protect ourselves within those rules of the road. So the first one, and again, this list of eight is by no means exhaustive. It's an attempt to consolidate things down into some grouped ideas. And uh, we'll roll through all eight here. But there's, of course, uh, finesse and in, in, in areas where they could be expanded on or pieces that where they overlap a little bit. Um, this is how it was published in NSAA journal and in 32 degrees. And it's kind of the way I've kept it since then. But um, I've kind of expanded some of the thoughts behind pieces of them. So stay alert. And this, is, this one's really about reacting quickly. Uh, when somebody stops suddenly or moves into your lane or when conditions suddenly change, being alert is the first step to being ready to make a change. And some of you spoke to that in, in the things that separated a collision from a near miss uh, or from a near collision, just being alert. If we are thinking about what we're gonna have for lunch, or if we're thinking about uh, you know, the, the text that we need to send, um, staying alert, means we're, we're present and doing what we need to do. Second one, stay focused. And this one's pretty similar, but being focused on the task at hand of skiing and snowboarding, right? This is a physical and mental task. There's a lot of our subconscious happening. There's a lot that's going on in the background, kind of behind the locked door in our brain. Uh, and there's a lot of, of physical exertion. Uh, we're paying attention to snow and weather, speed and position, and awareness of others' movements. Something that I've thought it, I just always fascinated me is uh, when you're approaching someone or when they're pulling away from you, the calculations, the physics that's happening in your brain just naturally to recognize that they're moving farther away or moving towards you and to adjust your own speed and position. Uh, there's a lot happening as we're just skiing and riding, as we're moving. The key is to focus on skiing and riding. 
Uh, distractions make you less able to see potential problems and properly react, right? This is the same thing with looking at a cell phone or any kind of distracted driving. We don't very often see people skiing or riding down the hill with their phone out actually looking at it, but I know I certainly have my camera out recording quite a bit with my students and that's pulling me away from this concept of focus. And um, so again, these aren't necessarily things that are, are rules of the road the way a uh, speed limit is. These are things you're gonna do to protect yourself. So um, being knowing that I'm gonna be less focused on my task at hand because I'm filming puts me into a higher level of alertness, right? So there's some, some uh, balance between some of these. So a recent study on cell phones and distracted driving showed it can take up to 27 seconds to regain focus after looking at your phone. If you think about the number of times you've sat down in your car, started the car, looked at your phone, put your phone back down, hopefully, and put your car in reverse, it's still 27 seconds from then, which at 10 miles an hour is a football field's length, right? So backing up, pulling out, and you get to that first stop sign, you're still not fully focused. So this, this idea that, um, that staying focused can actually reduce your alertness or, or looking at a phone, being distracted, can reduce your focus or reduce your alertness for a certain time period after you look at it. And, and if you think about, you know, like you just sent that text, but now you're thinking like, oh, did I say the right thing? Do I need to send another text? Do I follow up? Like things that happen behind the scenes of your brain after you've looked at your phone or engaged in a different task, it takes a while to get back to that task that you were, were working on. Third one here, scanning your surroundings. So this is checking your corners and blind spots frequently. This comes straight out of defensive driving, checking your mirrors, right? Looking around you and, and is, is the things that good skiers and snowboarders are constantly doing. And this is again, one of the big ones that comes out is separating a possible collision from an, a, from an actual collision is the more you're paying attention. If you're checking your corners and your blind spots and scanning the conditions ahead of you, you're more likely to see that, whether it's in your peripheral vision or uh, up ahead of you, or um, you know, because you checked over your shoulder, you saw that person five turns ago, and now your alertness level's gone up because you saw that maybe they looked like they weren't fully in control, right? The more you're moving your eyes, the more you're scanning your surroundings, the more able you are to make reactions. Watching out for others. This one's huge, anticipating the worst case scenario of what another person might do and adjusting your movements and routes in advance to reduce risk. So I think one of the things that separates a good snowboarder or skier from a average skier or snowboarder is this ability to anticipate the worst case scenario. We see that person making nice, even, synchronized, smooth turns down a cat track and we go, oh, I can pass on my left. A good skier or snowboarder, one that's regularly avoiding collisions is saying, well, they're making this turn, but what if they do this, right? Anticipating that worst case scenario and making your plan, planning your route based on what they might do, not what they are currently doing. Leaving space. So establishing and maintaining a safe following distance of three to four seconds. This is, again, straight out of cars. If you're right up on somebody and they make that quick change, it doesn't matter how alert or how uh, focused you are on the task at hand. If they make a quick change and you're too close, you're simply not going to be able to, to turn fast enough, right? So that three to four second follow time allows adequate time to react, change directions, or stops. And what's important about that three to four second um, is, is that amount of space that that entails. So whether you're going 10 miles an hour or 30 miles an hour, leaving that space of three to four seconds um, gives you that time. And all you have to do is as you're, as you're cruising, if you see, uh, if you're kind of following somebody down a run, you see them pass a tree, just start counting. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, you pass that tree. Cool, you're in that zone where you're gonna be able to safe, safely stop and, uh, and or avoid them if, they, if something happens to them. Having an escape route. This is what I spoke about with, uh, with Chuck as we were doing that exam. Knowing where your escape route is, right? Your safest position is where you can see and be seen. And I think about the number of, of instructors that I see out on the hill that maybe don't have the best stopping position, but they're in a stopping position where they can move quickly away from it, right? Where they can get out of the way if they need to. If you're stopped in a place right on an edge of a cat track where you can't easily jump out of the way, that's gonna be a less safe stopping point. So and paying attention to what those escape routes are. And, and that's something I do every time I'm stopped on a run now is kind of have in my head, like, what do I, what, where can I move? Um, and it's not, you know, I'm not writing out a plan. It's, it's very instinctual, but knowing 
where you can go to get out of the way of somebody who's out of control. Own the zone. This one's about speed. So ensuring your speed matches conditions and traffic, and that's especially in slow zones. Higher speeds make sudden stops or direction changes more difficult, and dramatically increase the severity of injuries, reduces the skier or rider's cone of vision. So uh, most of us can ski or ride at 30 miles an hour pretty, pretty comfortably, 25, 30 miles an hour. Uh, a, 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 survey, a research study on severity of injuries and car accidents showed that that increase from 20 to 30 miles an hour dramatically increases the uh, severity of the injuries. And at 30 miles an hour, a collision with a stationary object is roughly the same impact as jumping off a third story of a building and landing on concrete. So that amount of force and trauma. Now, if in the case with, with injuries on the mountain, often it's uh, collisions with two moving objects. And so it might not be as severe, but you know, we've all heard of fatalities of people running into trees or other stationary objects. 30 miles an hour is a lot of, of, of force and trauma for the body to sustain. So being sure that our speed matches conditions and, and traffic, especially in slow zones. The slower the other traffic is around us, the more severe that injury is gonna be if we're in a collision with that object or person. And then heads up to change up. Finally, and this one's kind of a recap of, of the others, it's up to you to protect yourself first. Look ahead, double check your blind spots before changing your maneuver task, direction, or speed. One of the primary things that comes up when you ask people what, what happened in a, something that was actually a collision was I was skiing in this corridor and I made a big left-hand turn. Or, um, you know, the person in front of me made a large turn. There's a change in the maneuver, uh, task, direction, speed, something changed and we weren't ready to respond to it. Um, that's one of the closest times I've ever been to getting hit. I was, I'd done most of this I was cruising pretty high speed down a large, uh, wide open run, making some big, big, large radius turns. And I made a turn towards my left and there was, there was a, another snowboarder right there. Like they'd, they'd been in my blind spot. Um, had it been a collision, I don't know who would have been at fault, but the reality is that would not have been a pretty collision for anyone. I mean, I was moving at least 30 miles an hour. Um, they were moving pretty quick. And, and that kind of that end, end of the like buck stops here is it's up to you to protect yourself. It doesn't matter if you're gonna be right or wrong on the skier responsibility code. I don't wanna be in that accident. And all it would have taken is one more check over my left shoulder and I would have seen them earlier, right? So I checked like two turns up. And so looking ahead for each, looking behind you, checking your blind spots, um, kind of keeping your head on a swivel, that whole concept. So these are, these are the eight all-in-one lists. Stay alert, stay focused, scan your surroundings, watch out for others, leave space, have an escape route, own the zone, and heads up to change up. I'll take a quick stop here uh, just to go through chat. If you have questions, if you have comments, so raise a hand. If, uh, if anyone wants to jump on and say anything related to those eight, if it makes sense, if it's comprehensive, or if you feel like there's something else you'd want to throw in there. Feel free to continue to type if you're in the middle of typing something, but uh, we'll keep going. Here we go. Some beginners are very concerned about people behind them. How do you address this? Yeah, so um, that concept, this is one of those ones about um, the responsibility code and the in interaction with defensive skiing and snowboarding, right? The responsibility code says the person in front of you, us has the right of way. Uh, and defensive skiing and snowboarding says we need to be checking our corners. I definitely go into the that, that concept that the person in front has the right of way, right? I, I try to make sure that my students understand that. Hey, your job is to worry right now about you and where you are, not worry about them. If they, if they are kind of out of control and, and gonna collide with you, especially in the beginning stages where I'm holding their hands, I'm working as an extra set of eyes looking up the hill for them, right? So I'm kind of saying like, hey, let me worry about that right now. And you focus on, on looking down the hill. Uh, and, and kind of approach it from that perspective of let's train them into this idea that they have the right of way and let's check our corners, let's check our blind spots. 
Um, I also spend a, a good bit of time because I teach both uh, primarily snowboarding, but I do teach some skiing. Uh, find that that people that do both tend to have a better understanding of the different blind spots, and I try to coach that to my students. Right, our our ski and snowboard blind spots are different. Our our bodies are exactly the same. Our eyes are exactly the same. But because of the way we stand, when I'm skiing, my blind spot's much more directly up the hill. When I'm snowboarding, it's to the side. And I think a lot of collisions between skiers and snowboarders happen because of a lack of understanding of that other blind spot. Um, you know, you'll, you'll hear someone say they were hit from behind when they were side by side, right? Or the snowboarder might cut across diagonally uh, across a run to, to which a skier should think that they'd be able to see each other and on a snowboarder, that's a blind spot, right? And so I'm um, trying to coach some of that difference in understandings. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Chuck says, I always told my kids when they learn to drive that everyone on the road is out to get them, same with skiing. And, and that's kind of, that falls in here, right? Defensive skiing and snowboarding is knowing, is, is anticipating that worst possible thing someone else could do at any given time and being ready, ready for that. 27 seconds regarding looking at your phone and then focusing again on your driving. I would guess it's much less. Uh, so this study is five or six years old. And, and my guess would be that that's, that that's getting narrower as we become more and more accustomed to using our phones all the time. That, that, that I, I don't have any data to back this up, but I think people have probably gotten better at, at looking at a phone and maybe, maybe that's, that's a trainable skill as well. But at that, at, this is, yeah, five, six years ago that that study and, and uh, 27 seconds was the average amount of time it took for someone to, if they looked at their phone uh, and they did, they had a bunch of different pieces. One was like reading comprehension, one was math based and like diving back into something that you were doing before you were interrupted by, by a text message on your phone. And um, it's, it's surprisingly long, the amount of time it takes for your brain to fully refocus on that. Uh, and it's similar when you look at, at, uh, some of the, the skills and, and, and tactics people talk about for uh, multitasking on, on your computer, right? If you've got a bunch of windows open, you're working on a document, an email pops up, then you see you've got a message in Basecamp. And then for some reason, all of a sudden you're checking Facebook. And like 45 minutes later, you realize that you still are back on that sentence you started an hour ago uh, in your Word document, right? So that concept of, of multitasking, we absolutely can do it. Some people are better at it than others. Um, and every single one of those steps takes us a little bit further away from focus. Uh, Richard, to continue your driving analogy in car racing school, lesson one is situational awareness and point one of lesson one is raise your eyes. Instead of focusing 10 to 20 feet ahead, look hundred feet ahead. You still see everything plus a whole lot more. Yeah, uh, we do a lot of, we've done a, a bunch of drills with, on snow with, uh, I'm sure most of you have done this, putting like a, a goggle cover or a glove or something into your goggles and and that sense of being being blind and somebody in an exam several years ago now uh, took that to the darkwing duck cape and they pulled their pulled their elbow up so you could still see the snow directly below you but you couldn't see further out and it's actually a much more uh, kind of safer way to do that same drill to be able to not see the distance but to be able to see your immediate surroundings and then switch that and put your elbow down so you can't see the snow directly below you. So I'm talking to my elbow that probably muffled it, but, um, but you could see distance and uh, how much that affected balance, right? With your elbow down, you can't see what's right underneath you, uh, but you had much better balance because you could see distance with your eyes, with your, with your elbow up, um, you could see the snow beneath you, um, but you still didn't have as good a balance because you couldn't see as, as far out. Uh, yeah, Donnie, I, I, I think there's two com a couple comments in here about the skiing and snowboarding um, and blind spots. And I, I fully agree, Donnie, the fact that blind spots are different and we are not aware of each other's perspectives. One of the reasons there's been animosity. I, you hear that all the time when people talk about collisions. Oh, that snowboarder ran into me. Oh, that skier ran into me. And so often it comes down to those different blind spots. And the more we can check our blind spots and educate people as to where those blind spots are, the better that, that relationship is going to be for sure. Uh, similar to coding, being in the zone, coding or working and being interrupted for a few minutes and getting back into the zone usually takes longer to get back into the zone. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Uh, all right. So one of the things that I want to make sure is clear is that these are trainable skills and behaviors, right? It's not something that you are born with or not. 
They're things that we can pay attention to and learn. Uh, and, and none of this is groundbreaking. I don't claim to have to take credit for, for any of this. This came out of, out of um, about 120 interviews and conversations with, with skiers and snowboarders that have been in collisions. And, and, and it was compiling that into this list. Uh, so it, it shouldn't be new or groundbreaking. What it should do is collect these into these eight elements, which are areas when there's a collision, when there's a near miss, uh, when you're skiing or riding, you can ask yourself about these eight elements. And, and more often than not, those are gonna be the distinctions between a collision or something that wasn't. And, and finally, this, the term defensive to skiing and snowboarding, it so often triggers, especially for those of us that, that kind of have more of a free ride oriented background, um, it, it triggers a, a little bit of a, of a picture of someone, you know, defensive driving with their fingers gripped on the steering wheel, you know, real close to the steering wheel, that, that kind of granny driver style of things on skis and snowboards, right? And it's not about being timid or cutting out the fun. It's, it's not about being cautious. Um, it's about being defensive and protecting yourself. And I think that word, that word choice, defensive skiing and snowboarding can come, raise some hackles for people sometimes. Um, and it's, it's really not about that timidness or caution or cutting out fun, but aligning tasks and behaviors with training conditions and being ready for whatever happens. So getting into the side of things about this being trainable, um, we at, at, at Vail then developed this list of 30 games and activities that you could train at a morning meeting, out with students, warm-ups and drills. And, um, and so, oops, didn't mean to pop that up. If you, we've done a few of these in, um, in the, in in-person presentations of this, getting up, um, you know, you get everyone to stand up. The, the one I love using is, is everyone stands up and, um, and you make a, a couple of groups, like if you've got round tables, each table is a group and you start out uh, three feet apart from each other. And uh, on, the, on the PowerPoint, I've got a kind of a selection of stop, go, stop, go, stop, go. And then like medium, fast, slow. So you've got like eight different groups of four or five people wandering around this room trying to find a path. And as, as they're doing so, they have to keep looking up at the screen to see whether it's saying slow, fast, um, stop, reverse, um, and then distance in between each person in the group. And so they're constantly have to look up, make adjustments to their group while watching uh, people move around. And, and it's, it's really fun and almost always results in at least a couple of, of close, close near collisions um, and uh, kind of fun way to move around in, in a group. But wanted to take that same approach to building something that you could use uh, to train at home or in person or uh, on, your, on your own, or in a small group in person with, with uh, a morning meeting or with your students as you're first starting out. And so rather than try to make this, this whole list, like I said, this is the first time presenting this, I um, thought I'd, I'd take it as, as group discussion. And we could either go the route of, of doing breakouts, but I, I think there's value in just keeping the group together. Looking at that list of eight, and I keep dropping it accidentally, um, Looking at that list of eight, pick one, doesn't matter which one, and, and just take the next two minutes, think about a way that you could highlight that one element of, of defensive skiing and snowboarding. Um, and I think, you know, at home in quarantine, obviously we, we've got pretty good social distancing right now. It's pretty easy to be safe, spatial aware when your closest neighbor is on a Zoom call. But think to a morning meeting and try to come up with, uh, you know, you've got 10 instructors standing there. What's a quick little game or drill you could do to focus on one element of those. And, uh, and if you want, if you've got a good idea for one and you want to voice it, uh, we'll take it to group group kind of, you can pop yourself off mute and, and share just one, one quick way you could focus on one of those.
I know you've got one, Lynn. You can see it. I think we can focus on spatial awareness right now. I'm going to take you guys for a walk through my place and let me know what you think. So if I go out from the patio, this is what's right by the door. And then there's some other stuff in my way. Everyone see that pink kettlebell? And there's more stuff. And then when I go towards the kitchen, there's a big rower in the way. And if I'm going this way, there are a bunch of weights. You just muted yourself, Lynn. <laughs> I think it's pretty important um, to have spatial awareness at home now because I've almost tripped over a bunch of that stuff if I haven't been paying attention. I was going to say, well, you got workout gear there or booby traps? <laughs> no, workout gear. Need something to do. Cody, table topping other instructors while we're at lineup makes them start to be aware of their surroundings really well. Yeah. Uh, you know, whether that's a full, you know, that might might uh, not go over so well in some of the safety cultures, but at least uh, playing the game and, you know, maybe not fully table topping them, but giving them a little push could certainly get people to start paying attention. One of the ones we used at a morning meeting uh, a couple years ago, a few times was, is, is tossing gloves. So uh, you get people to partner up, stand about 20 feet apart. One person turns their back and the, the other partner is holding the glove. They throw the, the glove towards the person with their back turn and say throw right as they did. So the person that is catching has to jump, do a 180, and then spot the glove and try to grab it, right? And so working on that idea of training your ability to react as soon as you see something, you're jumping, you're, you're doing something physical, you're turning, and as that glove comes into, into, uh, into vision, being able to react and grab. Those, those are the kinds of things that are trainable um, the, the more you do them, the better you're going to get at that reaction, the more you can speed up that reaction time. Anyone else have one they want to share? Okay. Another couple seconds here. Yeah, Tara, scanning the environment. Do you want to, do you want to elaborate on that? So I saw a supervisor use that one really effectively. There was always uh, an object. Yeah, put up stickers around the area, see if people notice them, um, or bring a specific object every day to line up, put it somewhere differently. And there was, there was a reward for who, who saw it first, right? So that concept of scanning the environment, always, always being aware of what's around you and what's different, being able to spot something. Um, there's, a, there's a booklet of, of 30 of these that um, I've, I've actually sent an email couple days ago asking permission to see if I can distribute it and I haven't heard back yet. So if you're interested in it, uh, I had my email address up on the screen earlier. It's Chris at livewinter, L-I-V-E-W-N-T-R.com. If you, uh, if you want to send me an email, if you are interested in it, I'm happy to distribute it once I get permission from, from Bale Resorts, but it's a list of 30 games like that, little activities you can do at morning meetings, at warmups, uh, warmups with your students, warmups with instructors and training groups that, that get into this idea of training spatial awareness, training reaction times, training uh, peripheral vision and being able to see and react. And uh, uh, yeah, that's So Chris at LiveWinter, L-I-V-E-W-N-T-R.com, and also at Chris Rogers Vale on pretty much all of the social media channels. Ryan, throwing a glove or object from instructor to instructor, saying the name of the instructor, adding multiple gloves or objects as time goes on makes it more challenging, needing to be more alert. I think you stole that one straight out of the book. You guys have that over at Beer Creek, I'm pretty sure. Um, but uh, yeah, exactly. Same idea, right? You're having visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. You can keep things more, more basic, by starting with just one of those elements, right? Visual, auditory, or kinesthetic. And as you add more balls into the air, as you add more gloves, as you add um, calling names, maybe you add a, a, a kinesthetic movement along with it, right? You gotta do a 180 or a 360, you gotta jump and then throw. You can start adding more complexity. And that's how we train these behaviors and skills is by adding complexity or by adding 
more, more elements to it. Right on. Um, any, that's, that's the content I had prepared. It uh, hits us right up at an hour. Any questions or other comments, things people want to throw in their own experiences, kind of open it up to uh, anyone that wants to unmute and uh, throw a question in or comment or, or uh, discuss further. Hey, Chris, this is Jennifer. And um, I work with children mostly between the ages of four and six. And as far as spatial awareness goes, what I like to do is I try to play a game where we count. Um, when I'm trying to get the children to make turns or even to load onto like a magic carpet, what I try to do is get them to count, not necessarily like one, two, three, four, five, but make it a game where we're tossing a ball back and forth or we're counting magical unicorns or hippopotamus or stuff that gives them their spatial awareness. They know that if they load on the magic carpet too fast or they make their turns too fast, they know they're going to crash into the student next to them. So make a game out of everything I do and make it fun. 100% Jen, that is, and that's um, this list, uh, the, the booklet, and I really hope I get permission to share it. Um, that booklet has, um, is, it's all game based for that exact reason. And some of them are a little bit more uh, have a little bit more cognitive element to it. You know, it's going to apply a little bit more to an instructor, but obviously you can slap a, a theme on it and, and turn it into a kid's game pretty, pretty quickly. But that idea of combining and kind of an active warm up with a game with something that's going to develop spatial awareness and in those kids, in those age groups, especially in three to six, it's when a bulk of their spatial awareness and situational awareness um, processing starts to develop that ability to see something and make a reaction is, is so key in those young ages. So, um, that hundred percent agree that that's, that's the best way to approach it with kids. Yeah, Lynn. What have you seen on the other end? I've noticed, um, spatial awareness and spatial skills begin to decrease in older adults, for example, in training with instructors who are like 60, 55 around there. I noticed a lot more near collisions and near misses than generally happens with instructors in their like twenties ish. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Unless, unless I'm that examiner and run into an exam, huh? <laughs> I, uh, a great example of spatial awareness in, uh, Lynn and I both had very quick reaction times. It was in an exam a couple years ago and we were both turning and ended up right on top of me. I, I ended up right on top of her board. And, uh, and we both managed to stay on our feet. But <laughs> I thought that's where you're going with that initially. Um, yeah, there is uh, absolutely a decline in performance, right? That reaction time as our, as our synapses age, as our, our, our bodies um, get older, that, that time it takes to process from seeing something to being able to make a reaction absolutely decreases. And you look at across any kind of, of sport or um, you know, mental, mental cognition area, there is a, a decline in the ability to see something and make a reaction instantly to it uh, as you get outside of that. And I, I think that, that bell curve, you know, it's peak performance is in the, in the 20s and 30s. And outside of that, you're kind of learning to make those changes and um, declining out of it. And, and the more you're, you're practicing, the more that you're working, through, uh, working on those elements, the longer you can keep them maintained. But we certainly see in, in uh, you know, especially in, in seniors, that decline in ability to make quick reactions. And that's whether that's driving, skiing, and snowboarding. But uh, the, the key pieces there, they are trainable. And so the more that you continue to work on them, the, uh, the better that you can uh, continue to stay strong with those reaction times for sure. So let's take that to the other end. We have an instructor who is, he's like 29 or 30. Um, you're going to know who it is. Don't say his name. Um, who is nearly a cert three, who comes very close to hitting people multiple times on nearly every run. He's a good rider. Like he's past his ride day, mm -hmm. but he almost hits people every single time we all ride together. Like yep. I'm a ride to ride in front of him. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's absolutely when you get into the, into these kinds of conversations, right there, there are exceptions to the rules always, right? We, we know, um, 
we know that on that on that really young end, we've got kids that are learning to do double doubles and and even triple corks that are in there, um, you know, late late teen or early teens. I mean, and and even like there's that the eight year old doing backflips last year videos that went viral. Right, we've got kids that are learning that air awareness that. Um, that perceptual vision, that that field sense, very very young, and so we know that it's trainable on that end, um, and and certainly on the flip side of that, there's people that have never been trained in that that field of spatial awareness, and maybe have even been told multiple times that they're too close or they're skiing dangerously, but don't understand what that means, and and so taking this this idea of defensive skiing and snowboarding as something that's trainable that's something you could work through with that individual in terms of how do you, you know, how do you start to get them to understand the difference in stopping? Well, one way to do that is to reduce the severity of the consequence. So, you know, doing an indoor exercise where you're going to create a situation where they're going to run into someone and it's going to be a lower consequence, right? So um, going back to that one I've used indoors, one, one of the steps is you've got these people moving all the way around, throughout those rooms, kind of these snakes of people moving through the room. But the other one is you're adjusting kind of accordion, accordion, accordioning the size of, of the group. And so you start out with people spaced maybe three feet apart and you, uh, or, or six feet apart within their individual snakes. And then as you go, you narrow it down to three feet and then two feet. And as you get closer and closer and closer, people find that their reaction times get much more difficult, right? So um, you throw the slide on that suddenly says stop and people are only a foot away from each other in their snakes there's like the, that domino effect. And so, you know, if you can manufacture a situation where you can create the collision in a low consequence environment, it's gonna be a way to help start to, to build awareness that they are not situational or spatially aware. So what would we do in a situation, for example, of where, um, if we're out riding or skiing and if we notice somebody who is going through a certain area and of course yellow jackets are out there trying to have them slow down and if they say look I'm skiing in control I'm skiing at a speed that is fast enough and then that can be a judgment call for a lot of us I, I think but what has been people's experiences of talking to these individuals and trying to get maybe some of them who are pushing the envelope a little bit. So Lynn, I appreciate you bringing the, this topic up because it reminded me of a couple situations. What are some of the things that we could try to do with some of these uh, individual skiers and riders to try to get them to understand, not necessarily convince, but try to get them to understand that, sure, you may be comfortable with that, but you know maybe the skier who are coming up nearby, you're not giving them a, a, enough space, for example, because you don't know how they're going to turn or if they're going to turn and so forth. So I'd like to hear what some of people's experience uh, is, have been along those lines, if anybody has any that they've talked to people about that. Sorry, that was pretty long. When... No, it's a great, it's a great question, Jay. Um, does anyone want to jump in and respond to that? At, at Winter Park, we've started to put up signage that uh, says give each other 15 feet of room when passing. Awesome. I think this is an area that we we focus on, you know, we, we educate our instructors often and we put out the responsibility code and, and often that's about all of the education we do consumer facing, you know, outside of ski lessons, if you're not in a lesson, you're probably not getting a lot of time with somebody who's gonna, gonna talk to you about these things in a proactive manner, which is why it's so often our yellow jackets or our speed control or our ski patrol after a collision that are the one having those conversations. And, and it is a tough, I think you bring up a really good point, Jay. It's, it's a tough one to have. I often feel like, you know, it's not my place to have that conversation with a member of the general public, unless they've had a near collision or a collision with my class, right? Like at, the, at that point, it's, I'm, I'm there as an employee, as a, as a mountain representative, I have to do something. Uh, but in terms of like flagging someone down, I, I personally tend to leave that to our yellow jackets, to our, our speeder control and, and, you know, not put myself in a place where I'm going to have that that confrontation, but I do think there's a need for us to be more proactive. And it's um, you know after I developed this and and got permission to share it with NSAA, it went in, in their journal as a as a tool for for consumer education. And I don't know how broadly it's been used outside of 
of VR. If, if you did the safety quiz last year at, at, at one of the Vail Resorts properties, you, you saw this material in, in one of the safety quiz videos there, or, or maybe that might've been two years ago. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's an area of consumer education that needs to be broached. And I think that's, that's kind of NSA's job, the National Ski Areas Association and the, the individual resorts. But hopefully tools like this start to create some of that, that conversation and that, that 15 feet that Donnie mentioned at Winter Park, that's depending on your speed, uh, that, that three to four second rule, that same concept that by spacing out and giving each other space, um, we're, we're creating that opportunity to make, make course changes before they turn into collisions. I think it's important as instructors that we keep in mind uh, about uh, uh, what fits and positives as we go through the different stages of uh, learning that we revert back to, uh, you know, looking at the ground and our awareness. It's kind of like looking through the, the small end of a funnel um, when, you're, when, you, when you move to that cognitive stage. So be, making sure that our student, that we're setting up um, safe surroundings for our students when they when they revert to not being able to really focus on not even as much as their their thumbnail less than that yes absolutely and, and you know anytime you're introducing something new i i i kind of uh you know you think about that attentional spotlight really being challenged by all of the other competing information that the more that's new if you're on new terrain you're in a new place you're introducing something new there's new sensations there's new sounds there's new uh, kinesthetic feelings that are happening. Um, they're, they're, you know, not everyone, if they haven't ridden a bike before or gone 30 miles an hour outside of an enclosed vehicle, there's a whole different sense of visual information. So yeah, that, that idea that there's too much, even, even watching a video, sitting on your, on, your, on your chair, watching that video on your computer of people jump roping, in that single video, there's too much visual information for your, for your brain to process alone. So now add in you're moving at 30 miles an hour on a skateboard holding your laptop and there's a car, you know, driving next to you, like all of these other things happening. It just, it just makes that, that uh, issue of the, of the attentional spotlight so much more important. Um, Alex, what do you mean how to apply this between the Rockies and their East coast properties? Can you go to more, Oh, sure, sure. So I, I teach on the East Coast, uh, yeah. um, right outside of New York City. Um, uh, and one of the other instructors talked about park slopes, 15, 15 feet uh, difference. Um, and I'll pick a little on, on Vail. So Vail now owns, owns Hunter Mountain, which is right outside of New York City. It's one of like one of the very, very, uh, very crowded uh, resorts. And, you know, on a Saturday, Sunday, I'm like, some of those slopes you can't get 15 feet <laughs> uh, space um, uh, or, or, or Mountain Creek, um, which is another really big, uh, you know, crowded resort in New Jersey outside of it. So that's where I was just trying to, to go with this, you know, the concept of applying safety in the big resorts in the Rockies is very different than in, in some of the East Coast. Yep. Thank, thank you, Alex. Yeah. I mean, some of the, some of the resorts in the, Midwest I've spent time at 15 feet is almost the length of the slope, right? The length of the, of the, uh, of the rope toe. And, um, and yeah, so anytime I'm, I'm, I'm totally joking. I love the rope toes. Actually, I think the rope toe, I really wish we'd get more rope toes in Colorado. I, I think the value to rope toes, like you're snowboarding or skiing the entire time and watching these kids progress as they're like lapping the park on a rope toe, they're, they're moving 35 miles an hour up the hill and they're still snowboarding. It's amazing. Um, but, uh, uh, I, I, there is a big difference there in, in how, how you balance those. And I think that's one of the things, you know, in, in putting those, uh, that list of eight together, it, they're not hierarchical. It's not like number one and then number two and then number three. And they're not meant to say all eight of those things are going to happen all the time necessarily, right? Like I make a conscious choice to lose my focus, you know, to reduce my focus by bringing a phone out to film because I'm using that camera to accomplish something else. As I do that, I think some of my attention or some of those other elements become more, uh, more important. So I'm staying more alert, even though I may be less focused on snowboarding. And I've certainly, um, I, I had a pretty good one in New Zealand last summer, uh, hooked an edge and like fully caught an edge and, and, uh, and heel edge like 
filming a student. And, you know, so like certainly there's issues when you're, when you're reducing focus, but I'm increasing my, my attention to other areas. And so to that point, you know, at Hunter Mountain on a weekend and there's 800 other people in the, in the, uh, in the bubble inside your personal bubble, you're that side of things may not, you may not have the ability to create as much space, but your alertness uh, is certainly going to go up. Your focus is going to go up, right? I certainly, when I've been in those situations, I'm checking my corners a lot more often. And so if you think about them as, as bubbles that can expand or shrink, um, kind of like we talk about in the learning connection model, like you might be paying a little bit more attention to the teaching corner or the technical corner or the people corner at any given time, but they can kind of grow and shrink. Same thing with these. If you're, um, if you've got a hundred percent of your available spatial awareness in those eight areas, maybe the, the amount of space you have is shrunk that's given you um, brain processing to, to focus on some of those other areas. So trying to expand in alertness, trying to expand in um, your own speed because of the, of the uh, lack of space. That's kind of the way I think about it. Uh, Jen, you have a question? Well, I was just going to comment on Dr. Barr, and he asked, he said something about teaching the children or teaching his younger students the code, like at quizzing them. And one of the first things that I do with all of my students is I instill the code. When we're inside, before they have skis on, before they have boots on, it's the code. Number one rule is always to stay in control. Doesn't matter where they're at on a bicycle, walking down the street, walking their dog, playing football, playing soccer. You stay in control. You always stay in control. That's, it's just part of my thing, I guess. And I'm going to go back to you asked if anybody had been injured. And yes, I have been severely injured as an instructor. So my big thing is I teach my children the code and I teach them always. Number one rule, stay in control doesn't matter what they're doing in life, you stay in control. Thank you, Jen, that's awesome. Cool, any other questions or comments anyone wants to throw out there? Um, the, I'm gonna throw something else in the, uh, in the comment, in the chats here. I put this up on Facebook yesterday. I've been talking to a couple other clinicians around the world. Um, about how to start to build these into something that's uh, sustainable and ongoing and uh, doing more, hopefully more with Zoom and, and, and continuing that through, this, through the winter season in the next year. Um, so just posting a, a link to a survey here, ask some questions about um, the value you've received out of, of uh, webinars and Zoom meetings like these and, um, and possible some kind of what you would expect to pay in, in a few different formats. Um, and, and I'm just kind of looking at how we might be able to make it sustainable to bring clinic leaders from all over the world and other organizations to present in front of a global audience as well. Um, so kind of playing with some of that. If you have five minutes, um, jump on that, that link and, and fill out a survey, and, uh, and I'd really appreciate it. Lou J, I like that. Cold days. Control, obstruct, lifts, devices, avoid, yield, signs. That's awesome. Right on. Well, feel free to follow up with other comments, conversations via email or on social media. Uh, I posted that up a little bit up above in the chat. I'll uh, copy and paste it down again. And uh, yeah, feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to chat snowboarding, skiing, safety, whatever. And uh, yeah, again, you know, these are usable, trainable elements, but they're not meant to mean skiing timidly. And that's, that's the biggest, biggest takeaway is in using that term, please don't think of it. It means like gripping the steering wheel and like being afraid of everything, it's just mean to protect ourselves. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Pleasure. Thanks for being here. Bye, Stephanie. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Kelly. Good to see you. You too. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. Welcome. Thanks for being here, Jay. Hey, thanks, Chris.
I, I, I ended up ordering that uh, little snowboard guy. Awesome. You had on that last thing. I got it coming in the mail. Right on. Where'd you find him? I, it, it's, it's in another country it's coming from. <laughs> Right on. Search on online there, but anyway, oh, thanks so a lot. Uh, bye bye. Later. Thanks, Chris. You too.